Hello, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome everybody again. Today we are here to discuss endocrinology and we'll get the evening rolling quickly because you all are exactly one week short of time right now. So one week from now you'll be writing your exam on the same day. All the best for that and I've been asked to give you some last minute revision strategies which we will discuss at the end of the session and uh, I'm hoping to see most of you join now and there's one more thing uh, we had already planned another class but this seems to be uh, last class before your August 24th exam so we'll discuss everything that we need to discuss in this one itself and I think we'll wait for a minute or two before others join. I hope I'm audible and that's not an issue today. So endocrinology basically is a very confusing topic and uh, a lot of you get confused in a lot of things which we will try to solve today. Try to break it down for you so that you can remember it easily. Not only that, you can also uh, be confident in answering your questions. All right, I think most of us have joined. So let's get started again. Okay, successful man. All of you are. Okay. So <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hashir. So let's get started with the first one. Hello, Dr. MJ. Good evening. Hello and good evening, Dr. Elia Bharti. Welcome. So like I already mentioned, uh, this is the class before the August 24th exam. Hello, Dr. Karthik. Good evening and welcome. And Dr. Aisha and Dr. Karthik break the silence with A. And uh, anybody else wants to take I'll also be discussing a little bit about how to deal with the exam today. So since you have to give an answer for all of the questions, there are no negative marking. I want all of you to, you know, just make a guess. Just write anything, A, B, C, D, doesn't matter. But then make a guess because that is what you will also do in your exams in certain questions. I want to see how close your answers are, right? Okay, Dr. Hashir. Okay, so... Let's start the evening with A, diabetes insipidus, a very important topic for your exams. Now, some of you are confused about how to diagnose, but it's quite simple if you look at it. So basically we are talking about diabetes insipidus, but why investigations not given? Okay, Dr. Karthik is upset that we have not given the investigations. That is because the question is designed that way. Don't worry, in your real question, the investigations will definitely be given. Okay. Yes, yes, all the investigations will be given in your exams. 
the questions today that I'll be discussing are designed a bit differently. They are on a little bit on the tougher side. So you can relax. The real exam questions will be a little bit easier than this one. Since this is the last session today before the August 24th exam, we have decided to go and make it like that. All right. So let's discuss something about insipidus first. Diabetes, insipidus. All the topics today we'll be discussing are very interesting. Now, as far as this question was concerned, a patient was having sickle cell and sickle cell patients are at risk of infarcts. And so pituitary infarct is a common thing, okay? So basically what happens is posterior pituitary stops producing ADH, doesn't go to the kidneys, kidneys stop concentrating the urine, okay? All right, let's get back here to the question. And uh, analgesia, opiate analgesia is not uh, necessarily, will not cause so easily uh, your uh, DI, but it can cause polyuria sometimes. I mean, it cannot cause polyuria as in this case. Obstructive uropathy, there are no symptoms. Psychogenic polydipsia, there are no symptoms suggesting this one. All right, so we'll go with this one. Now, I want, I want to highlight here is, you have to understand how will you uh, find out whether it's uh, normal, craniogenic, nephrogenic, or primary polydipsia. It's quite easy if you just remember this small chart. If you look over here, the initial plasma osmolality, that is your serum, your blood, Values will have high osmolality in others and very low in primary polydipsia because it will be a chronic condition, okay? Just remember this will be chronic, so it will take its time to act. So your plasma osmolality will be low, rest it will be high, okay? So you can easily differentiate that. Question mentioning uh, young female with history of depression, okay? So you can... Uh, guess that it's primary polydipsia. I will also be telling you what all the other questions will mention because endocrinology is very vast and we have to finish it very quickly. Now, let's say you take the final urine osmolality, both in the cases of nephrogenic as well as craniogenic DI. The final urine osmolality will be low as you can see here. Okay. So, you will give arginine vasopressin okay now when you give that if your kidneys are reactive to that as in the kidneys recognize your arginine vasopressin they will show an increase in the urine osmolality so it will increase okay ideally it should be between 350 to 750 but okay 600 is a good amount where it should increase more than this number okay so once your kidneys are responsive to DDAVP, that means it is craniogenic. That means the kidneys are all fine. Okay, it is the lack of ADH that is driving the DI over here. Let's talk about nephrogenic. In this, the kidneys will not be responsive. Okay, it just remains the same, right? As it was previously. Okay, so final plasma levels will be corrected in craniogenic, will not be corrected in nephrogenic. Okay, I hope that's clear. It's quite easy if you solve certain questions, uh, it will be very clear to you. Okay, I hope it's, it's very simple if you just look at it and remember this table. Okay, all right, uh, let's not waste any more time. Don't worry, Dr. Kathik, uh, there will be uh, much more detailed investigations given in your exams. Questions that we will deal today are a bit on the difficult side. Sometimes even we can be like that. But then you all are answering correctly, so it's pretty cool.
Dr. MJ is quick. All the answers and all the things that we are discussing here today will be very strictly for your MRCP part one examinations, right? I think that's clear. We are not talking about medicine right now. We are talking about MRCP. Hello and welcome Dr. Reji. So Dr. MJ, Dr. Karthik and Dr. Reji all agree on B. Dr. Aisha also says B. So let's go with B. Lithium. Now remember lithium is the most Okay, Dr. Hashir says carbamazepine. Okay, but the answer is B. Okay, so remember for your exam purposes, lithium is the most common cause of nephrogenic DI, and I will write it down like that. Okay, as far as the RCP is concerned, this will be your most common in answer, as in it will be present in all of the questions. You see at lithium, and you should start thinking of nephrogenic. Let me write it down. Nephrogenic DI. Okay. Any patient talking about uh, any patient that is on lithium, long term, short term, six months or something. Six months is enough for lithium to start acting on your kidneys. So just remember this association. It's a very important one. See lithium, start thinking of nephrogenic DI already. Okay. All right. Next one. So we have already discussed DI right now. So let's move on to the next topic. Okay, Dr. Uh, Weasley, Leslie, sorry. Dr. MJ says A, Dr. Aisha says B, Dr. Karthik says A, Dr. Ilya Bharti says E, Dr. Regina says B. Hello and welcome, Dr. Vishal. You also say A, Dr. Hashir says B. Okay, so we have a mixed response and uh, I understand why that is there. But the thing is, uh, the word bilateral proptosis over here should make you think about Graves' disease. I understand your point about cavernous sinus thrombosis being derived from this one, if I'm not wrong, right? OCP usage is driving you towards this, but it will usually cause a unilateral one, not a bilateral, okay? Usually for your exams. For exams, if you see bilateral proptosis, as in the eye signs are bilateral, then you should go ahead with Graves disease. Also, in your investigations, uh, if you see the patient being euthyroid or hypo or hyperthyroid, don't be deviated from your uh, diagnosis of Graves disease because the eye signs associated with Graves can present before the uh, manifestation of the real disease, right? So I'll just quickly write it down for you. I am sorry, I will not be uh, uh, like explaining the other options right now because uh, this one is strictly for your exam. So remember this, this is for your exam. If you see bilateral, uh, Graves this is your answer, okay? So I'll take the time to write bilateral fully. So the clinical features will be proptosis, lid lag, lid retraction,
periorbital puffiness and of thalmoplegia. Okay. Obviously, Graves' disease can also cause unilateral. proptosis um, cavernous hemangiomas tumors orbital cellulitis Uh, lymphomas and GPA, that is granulomatosis with polyangitis, also known as Wegner's, previously known as. So these are your regular causes for unilateral proptosis. Okay. Right. Uh, let's move ahead. Remember Graves' ophthalmoplegia or ophthalmopathy can present before overt, clinically overt uh, thyroid problems are very evident like hypothyroidism or something, okay? So it can be given in the question that all of your thyroid tests are normal, your complete thyroid profile is normal, but the patient is having eye signs, so it will be graves. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Hmm. So, Dr. Reji and Dr. Pavan have answered already quite fast. Hello and welcome, Dr. Pun Agar. You go with D, okay? You seem to have retracted your answer. That's okay. Don't worry about making mistakes. Dr. Aisha says E, Dr. Hashish says B. Bromocryptine. Hmm. Dr. MJ says E. Okay. All right. And Dr. Elia Bharti says D. We, I don't think we have reached a consensus in this answer, but that's okay. Dr. Vishal, you say B. Okay. The word initial is driving you towards different answers, I suppose. So, if let's go uh, by the options so let's see difficult to control blood pressure patient mentioned his rings are becoming tighter so definitely we can see an increase in growth hormone that is acromegaly now dentist because of difficulty chewing and all so there are some issues with his jaw and visual field testing revealed no deficit now this point marks towards if this was present, like let's say the patient had a hemianopia, that is bi-temporal hemianopia. So then that would be a pituitary uh, macroadenoma, okay? When the size is large, it starts pressing on the optic as, and that causes that. So, but that's not there, great. So let's see what is the initial treatment. If the major concern for the patient was an increase in prolactin, so then you would be given promocryptin, okay? But here, Always remember, increase in growth hormone, acromegaly, most important, most appropriate, anything, anything, anything. Question says anything, the answer will always be transphenoidal surgery. Unless the question says except, of course, right? So transphenoidal surgery is the answer here because it is the most appropriate initial treatment. I'll tell you why shortly. So 
acromegaly. Let's discuss this quickly. The first signs uh, will be difficult to control hypertension. All right. Then you will have increase in the size of hands and feet. Some questions will also ask you about long term complications. Most important long term complications will be cardiovascular. Okay, remember that. So, this ring not fitting is a very classic question for RCP. Okay. Prognathism. Uh, the palms will become doughy, uh, enlarged testes. Hmm. Uh, there's one more thing. Uh, if the question stem mentions about patient developing carpal tunnel syndrome, which nerve are we talking about when we talk about carpal tunnel syndrome? Please tell me. So, carpal tunnel syndrome could be a symptom of acromegaly. Okay, keep that in mind, especially in your exams. And bitemporal hemianopia. Great. Yes, Dr. MJ, you are correct. We're talking about the median nerve. Yes. Now, in when you when you want to perform tests about something, so like they always say, when we have a deficiency of the hormone, we will try to stimulate the production of the hormone. When there is excess of the hormone, we will try to suppress the production of the hormone. Right. So diagnosis. We will give a load of glucose and that will fail to suppress the growth hormone. So during a standard OGTT test. Okay, and complications. Remember, CVS complications are most important. You can have arrhythmias, you can have biventricular hypertrophy. All right, I'll write it down. Yes, Dr. Karthik, you're right. So, the, remember CVS, okay, as a major complication. You can also have uh, diabetes in the patient with acromegaly. That's a complication. Type 2. Okay. And you can also have uh, increased in triglyceride levels. Right. All right. So this is an excess of growth hormone. Very, very important question. You can be very sure to see this. First treatment is always transphenoidal surgery unless there are some contraindications or the patient refuses the surgery. Okay. In cases of acromegaly, if this was about pituitary adenoma causing increase in prolactin and you want to suppress that then we will go ahead with bromocriptin okay yeah and uh, octreotide also same uh, but octreotide will not be uh, yes of course uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Regina, uh, you are right. Uh, we also do IGF-1 levels because these are long-acting ones. I mean, the, not long-acting. The half-life of uh, insulin-like growth factor 1 is quite large. So the levels will be constant during the day. So let me just put it this way. IGF-1 is the most important. If this is not given in your question, then you can go with OGTT. Yeah, let me put it this way. Thank you, Dr. Reji. Uh, right now, you will be going with IGF-1, that is insulin-like growth factor 1, okay? Because the growth hormone levels tend to fluctuate throughout the day. They have a diurnal variation, 
this diurnal variation will cause you not to get a static value that's why we go with igf1 okay and uh, that is one more reason uh, you can see a clear cut relationship why the patient will be uh, developing diabetes in the later course of the disease thank you dr raji yeah okay next one Uh, I tend to correct it over here. The patient's age will be 55 years. Okay. Hello and welcome Dr. Shady and uh, okay I understand today we are going to have a lot of mixed responses because the questions are not so clear cut like I said and hello Dr. Sam Fay. Um, all right so the answer that I would want to go over here and the reason why I changed the age of the patient in the first instance was this um, you should note here that the patient is diabetic okay and the age of the patient is more than 50 years that is 55 or anything okay as for most of you who are focusing on this sentence the idea is whenever you get a question in which you have a uh, medication called uh, varenicline or bupropion or any other things like that the first thing you have to do is you have to refer the patient to a stop smoking clinic and then we will decide over there what is the best treatment modality for the patient okay uh, just a sentence given over here does not mean that the patient is quite ready for uh, pharmacotherapy there are other therapies also and the only way to understand that is when you talk to the patient in a uh, clinic okay you have to understand how committed the patient is only when the commitment is made sure and uh, the patient has tried a lot of other ways you can try varenicline with nrt that is nicotine replacement therapy okay so varenicline and nrt slash bupropion and nrt these both are equally effective options any of these is actually the correct if that was the case but here in this question what we are trying to look at is we are trying to find out when a patient is diabetic okay and a diabetic patient more than 50 years of age please add a statin okay this is your latest guideline recommendation uh, this has been shown uh, to reduce your pace that is mortality from all causes cardiovascular events right this has been shown and it is already proved now so this is an approved treatment so remember this point okay don't forget this if you see a diabetic more than 50 years of age please add a statin to that patient uh, without any other uh, requirement also you will see that there are no triglyceride hdl ldl values given over here in the question so it seems very uh, different but then yes this is the answer and that is the reason why i changed the age of the patient remember diabetic patient 
more than 50 always remember to add one start into the prescription and uh, surprisingly in this patient the hpa1c is pretty good it's actually way ahead than our target so with that we don't need to change anything in that okay great all right let's go ahead again I hope you guys are learning something new today, just like me. Okay, so Dr. MJ, Dr. Ilya Bharti, Dr. Raji, Dr. Aisha, Dr. Hashir, Dr. Karthik, and Dr. Pavan. All of you say D. So I also say D. Spironolactone is the correct answer. This man has gynecomastia, right? And this is increase in the male breast tissue, secondary to increase in the estrogen levels. That is the balance between the estrogen and androgen ratio is disturbed. The estrogen levels go higher. So you need to remember the causes of gynecomastia. This could be present in your question. So the first one will be physiological. If a worried mother presents to you in the clinic with a young male with enlargement of the breast tissue, uh, let them know this is physiological. Next would be testicular failure. That is a decrease in the androgen levels. Uh, liver disease most importantly as we discussed in the respective chapter then androgen deficiency like line filters and kalman syndrome and drugs there's a whole list of drugs in the pharmacotherapeutic chapter but for starters we will remember spironolactone cimetidin which is not used anymore, but still uh, there's also digoxin, there's uh, finasteride, and of course there is estrogen itself. For some reason, if you are keen on giving that. All right, let's move on to the next one. The whole idea about um, today's session is I want to point out those specific words, those specific keywords that will be given in your exam, like the last question and even before that, like we mentioned. So you have to remember those words. If you see those words in the exam, you have to straight away and shoot for the answer. Don't think twice. Dr. Elia Bharti breaks the silence. Dr. MJ. Hmm. Dr. Raji. Dr. Kathak, Dr. Pavan. All of you say B. So I say B along with you. Dr. Aisha also says B. All right. So this is an inherited disease, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Now, You will not diagnose Kalman syndrome in your exam without this sentence. Okay, I'm writing it in big letters for me. <laughs> so if that is basically the olfactory bulbs Okay, 
So in your exam, if you want to go ahead with Kalman syndrome, the moment you see loss of smell and any other signs of androgen deficiency, go ahead without thinking twice. All right. Basic defect is in the production of olfactory bulbs. Right. You also have short stature and you have infertility, of course. That's why the patient will present to you. You will have a poor a sense of smell and this uh, facial and axillary that is secondary sexual hair growth will be reduced just like Klein filters. So, but in Klein filters, the stature of the patient will be tall. Remember that. In Kalman, patient is a short stature. Don't forget this one. All right, most of you are correct. I mean, all of you are correct. So let's go ahead. Okay, Dr. MJ, Dr. Kathik, Dr. Reggie, Dr. Aisha, Dr. Hashir. All of you say A. Let's go with A. So this is the previously called testicular feminization syndrome or complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. Right? Now... The word I will write here testicular feminization. It's not for you to get confused, but for you to understand the pathophysiology behind it. Okay, and these two words actually make quite uh, the whole thing quite simple, right? So uh, the person is of XY genotype, but phenotypically, the patient is a female. Okay, so there is androgen insensitivity at the levels. Uh, so end organ insensitivity is there to androgens. So the testicular over here, if you read uh, this sentence, whenever you see this, you have to go with this one. Okay. Or it could also be there like a question stem saying that the patient was um, treated for undescended testes initially when the patient was uh, uh, in the initial three, four year old uh, kid. Okay. So remember that. Other secondary sexual characters are not there. So basically your testosterone gets converted to estrogen. This causes your breast development. Also, there will be primary amenorrhea. Right? 
The groin muscles are testes, like I just told you, present in the inguinal canal. Treatment is with counseling and female hormone supplementation. That is replacement. Okay, I think all of you are very clear on that because all of you answered correctly. Let's move ahead to the next one. And like we discussed, Okay, Dr. Karthik breaks the silence. Dr. MJ is quick again. And Dr. Satyam, okay, hello and welcome Dr. Satyam. Um, Dr. Reji also says E. Dr. Aisha also says E. Dr. Pawan, Dr. Hashir. Oh. So, I'm glad to see all of you. Answering absolutely correctly. This is Kleinfelter syndrome. XXY genotype. Okay, patient will present to you with the complaints of infertility. The clinically, the patient will be of tall stature, like I mentioned earlier. Then uh, small sperm testes. Poor development of secondary sexual characters. and gynecomastia of course there will be infertility you will diagnose it by karyotyping all right let's go ahead Hello, Dr. Satyam. Hi, and good evening. Ah, like Dr. Karthik was mentioning earlier, here are some investigations for you to go through. Uh, there's one investigation in particular that will make all the sense for this. I will mark it down for you just to make your life easier. Dr. MJ is quite quick to answer. Dr. Reji also says D. Dr. Karthik says D. So, Dr. Hashir, Dr. Ilya Bharti say D. Dr. Ilya Bharti says B, Barter syndrome. We'll get to that. And Dr. Aisha also says D. So, let me remove this. There are two things, hypertensive and hypokalemia, right? So, 
Dr. Eliyamati, you have to understand that the patient over here is hypertensive. Once you remember this, you will not sway from your answer. The answer is little syndrome. And Dr. Satyam also says D. We'll get to it quickly. There are basically two things you need to remember. One is hypokalemia with hypertension. The second one is hypokalemia with normal blood pressure. Okay, no hypertension, right? So the first one is little syndrome over here. There are other causes also like Cushing's. And then you have Kahn syndrome, right? Uh, you also see that in 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, but you don't have to remember that. Okay, just remember Liddles. Uh, if you're getting confused in Liddles, Barter, and Gentleman, there's very simple thing. Liddle syndrome is quite separate from these two. Now here you will see Barter and Gentleman. So. I'll just tell you how to remember these two. Coming to Liddles back here. Um, patient will have hypokalemia with hypertension. What's the problem going on with the patient, right? So this is mimicking hyperaldosteronism, right? And uh, with barter, you have sodium potassium chloride channel deficiency i mean there's a defect in the thick ascending loop of helene right the gentleman's there's defect in the thiazide sensing channels thiazide sensitive sodium chloride in the DCT, discal convoluted tubule. Okay, so these will be present when the patient has a normal blood pressure. Now, this will present early in life. This will present a little later, at least later than this. So, if the patient is quite young, let's say five to 10, 15 years, try to go with barters. If the patient is uh, older, let's say more than 20, 25 years old. I mean, older than Barters, not old in particular, then it will be Chittleman's, okay? Because the symptoms will be quite similar. So it can get confusing in that. So age is the only differentiating factor clinically. Obviously, if you can check these, uh, you can get to an answer. But you that will not be given in your question, right? So I hope it makes the things a little bit more clearer. Hypertension, it's quite clear, it's little. The patient is normotensive, then you have either barter or gentleman's. If the patient is very young, it's barter. If the patient is little elder, gentleman's. All right. Great. Let's go ahead. Okay, so all of you are answering correctly, and that is B, hydrocortisone. All of you are quick to diagnose a dysonian crisis. Um, okay, all of you have answered, I guess. Yes, so B is the correct answer. Hydrocortisone is the initial step in management. Of course, you will also supplement the patient with lots of fluid. 
whenever you see a patient with history of nausea and vomiting okay a lot of fluid is lost already by the time the patient presents to us think of addisonian okay and there's also pain abdomen i'll write it over here so that you remember it in the question itself so this will be present with other autoimmune diseases okay you will also have an associated history of let's say uh, vitiligo or uh, other autoimmune diseases like uh, uh, type 1 diabetes okay hypothyroidism etc the first most important treatment will always be hydrocortisone in fact so much so that if the patient is not in a crisis and you give hydrocortisone one dose uh, you can still go ahead with the tests next day okay one dose of hydrocortisone is not going to change anything so you can give that next will be fluids okay remember this order okay and uh, there are two things that you should look for most important feature will be autonomic dysfunction that is the patient will not be able to maintain the blood pressure when the patient gets up from a lying down position okay so this will be the most important feature given in your question if the patient is unable to do that we will be notified of autonomic dysfunction and when that is present along with this think of addisonian crisis okay okay i hope that's clear let's go ahead hmm okay so all of you say d so i'll go ahead with d and that's the correct answer metformin over here uh, there is a significance of this patient being a heavy vehicle driver that is a lorry driver because if the patient is a heavy vehicle hello and welcome dr zainab yeah so uh, let's talk about diabetes over here now there are a lot of things that we need to know first things first a newly diagnosed case 
first will always be diet and exercise remember this order okay then you will add metformin after that you are free to choose from a wide range of antidiabetic oral antidiabetic agents that you have but this is the basic guideline okay now next uh, remember that metformin is contraindicated in patients with CKD so uh, if you have creatinine around 150 or something then it is contraindicated okay so you need to know where all all these medicines are indicated as well as their respective particular contraindications okay now if the BMI of the patient is very high okay let's say more than 30 then you will be starting GLP-1 RA if the patient's BMI is if you do not want weight gain like but the patient's weight is normal okay then you will be starting the patient on gliptins that is dpp4 inhibitors okay in this if the patient is a ckd patient give lenagliptin okay all right this will not only cause yes uh, there is some guidelines that say that you should use metformin cautiously but absolutely contraindicated if the gfr or egfr is below 30 yes you are correct okay this will uh, this is actually a very costly drug okay so once you are using a glp1 ra uh, the idea is that you should see a weight loss okay if this is not achieved uh, in the six months time then you will stop this drug but initially just remember also preferred for patients of heart failure since it lowers down your uh, but rather uh, instead of this one if you go with uh, SGLT2 that you can if there is a clear-cut heart failure patient then you go with SGLT2 inhibitors okay so any CVS patient if you see uh, with a lot of CVS uh, comorbidities then go with SGLT2 inhibitors all right then what else do we have here okay yeah as far as insulin is concerned if you start insulin in patients who are heavy uh, that is basically group 2 then they cannot drive okay so you should be very careful in starting insulin in such patients also if you patient if your patient experiences a lot of nocturnal hypoglycemia then you have to uh, add in insulin glargine Sometimes your uh, questions will ask you what is glycine actually you have a glycine and uh, two arginine replacements right sometimes your question will give you another long acting insulin and they will tell you that the patient is having hypoglycemic episodes so try to convert it to glycine in that particular case okay also remember that insulin will uh, help you get a moderate amount of uh, weight gain in the patients so if that is there just keep it in your mind and also that metformin is also contraindicated where you have acidotic patient okay 
lactic acidosis it causes so remember that i think this is it let's go ahead yeah If the patient is progressing on CKD and going from stage 3 to stage 4, metformin should be the first drug that you take off the prescription. Okay. There are a lot of questions on metformin actually. Okay, Dr. MJ, Dr. Reggie, Dr. Kathik say B, Dr. Hashir says E. Um, single toxic nodule, okay, you are diagnosing it correctly clinically, but what is going on behind the scene is basically it's a subacute thyroiditis. Okay. So, yes, Dr. Elia Bharti, Dr. Pavan, all of you are correct. This will be a diffuse reduced uptake. Because this is a case of Dr. Aisha, you're correct. Uh, this is a case of subacute thyroiditis, right? The idea is that this tenderness over here, pain on palpation of the neck, the neck is tender, any such words are there in your question stem. Think of subacute thyroiditis, okay? Now, Dr. Um, I think Hashir, yes, Dr. Hashir could counter me by saying that these values point towards. Uh, hyperthyroidism picture right but the idea is that this will settle down okay that is why we say thyroiditis obviously uh, there is something going on with your thyroid so the values will go haywired but don't get swayed okay uh, recent viral or upper respiratory tract infection or viral infection the history will be there it will be a female mostly okay and the most important feature i will actually write it down in red okay this will be definitely present this is the feature that defines it separate from others in treatment you don't have to do anything you just have to give an sids okay and it fairly it settles this down on its own you just have to wait uh, there will be hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism picture. Mostly it will be a hyperthyroidism picture. And there will be a, a imaging. There will be a diffuse. Reduced uptake on scanning. But don't confuse it from hyperthyroidism per se. Okay. Because this will go away. Right. And you don't need to give any. Uh, a replacement or stop and block therapy like abimazole or propyl thyroid okay don't go ahead with that i will write it actually no need for ptu or carbimazole okay guys i hope i'm clear this is that exact particular question which you will get in your exam when you see tender neck think of me and go ahead with subacute thyroiditis okay let's go ahead
okay so all of you answer a that is 24 hour urinary cortisol test and dr zainab says d uh, which is okay but it is not very uh, prudent to look for the lesion directly doing a pelvic ultrasound test you cannot go directly to the adrenals and look for the cause uh, this is talking about initial diagnostic test when you have a diagnostic dilemma and you're looking for a cause other than your normal production then you will do this one okay okay so we have a lot of mixed response but uh, remember guys both of these tests are equally useful as an initial diagnostic test okay uh, one more thing uh, the, it, it has not been mentioned over here that whether this is a low dose or high dose so you can be fairly sure that this is an initial test i would actually prefer you to answer this one okay i understand that uh, please remember that both dexa suppression test and 24 hour urinary cortisol collection are initial tests okay but this one has a higher sensitivity so don't worry in your exam both of these options will never be given in fact what will be given will be uh, i mean what we can safely assume to say what we can be given is your it will be given like a low dose or a high dose we'll quickly get to that let's first talk about cushing syndrome i hope i'm clear right so the clinical features all of you know weight gain a lot of weight gain hirsutism Uh, menorrhea, hypertension, and then you can have bruises, easy bruising on the patient, acne, sometimes depression also. Now, when you go on that hunt to find out where is the cause first you will do low dose dexa suppression test this is done to find out whether actually uh, the acth levels are high or low whether they get suppressed initially the acth will not get suppressed by your low dose dexa test okay so then next you will do the second stage is high dose dexa test now you do this high dose dexa test to identify the location that is whether the source is pituitary if it is pituitary it will get suppressed versus ectopic if it is ectopic it will not get suppressed okay fine okay so that is how you will uh, go about these tests but as an initial test both 24 hour urinary cortisol and dexa suppression tests are equally correct and uh, rest assured you will not get both these in your uh, question okay it will not be present in your stem but i gave it over here just to mention this point that the dexa suppression test has a higher sensitivity okay
Okay, Dr. Reggie breaks the silence. Um, we are talking about subclinical hypothyroidism. And why is it dangerous actually? Okay, so the answer, correct answer is osteoporosis. Okay, and uh, we'll see here most likely complication. And Dr. Karthik, you were saying C, which is uh, these options are mentioned in the exact reverse order. Okay, so I'll just write down the things uh, we are talking about hyperthyroidism. Okay, so uh, you can also see that the free T4 levels are pretty normal over here. Okay, they are in the normal range but the TSH levels are suppressed, okay? So this is a subclinical one, right? All right, uh, yeah, so. Hyper, it's going up. So it basically increases everything, your heart rate, uh, weight loss so you get uh, increased tachycardia and you even get uh, AF you can get arrhythmias but you can get AF okay there will be weight loss it increases everything except it causes amenorrhea okay not menorrhagia and menorrhagia will be caused in the case of hypothyroidism okay so those options are exactly of hypothyroid picture Microcytic anemia, okay, and uh, proximal myopathy, most importantly, osteoporosis. And most of the question stem will also mention about heat intolerance in cases of hyperthyroidism. So be wary of that. Cold intolerance is in the case of hypo, and heat intolerance is in the case of hyper. So everything gets increased in hyper except your menses. Okay, so there's an amenorrhea over here. And obviously osteoporosis is the right answer. Okay, all right. So I think it's time for a quick short break. Uh, we'll get back to you in 10 minutes. Please stay tuned. We have a whole lot of other questions to discuss again. Okay, take care.
Okay, hello and welcome back everybody. Um, back again. I hope all of you are still there with us and you're enjoying the session already. So let's get back straight without wasting much time. We are running really short on time today. And all of you have been really amazing today because you are just answering absolutely all the questions very correctly. So I hope all of you have got your snacks just like me. So let's get back and let's get straight into it. So here's your next question for the evening. Okay, Dr. MJ is quick again to break the silence and he says correctly, metabolic syndrome. You're right. This is the correct answer. Okay, so obese patient, high BMI, although the blood pressure levels are normal here, the TG levels are raised. Okay, fasting glucose levels are below diagnostic levels but i'll get straight to the point yes dr kartik dr reji you're right this is metabolic syndrome let's talk about metabolic syndrome quickly I'm trying to take the session a bit quickly today because we have a lot of areas to cover yes dr hashir you're right dr aisha you're right as well Okay, so the criteria are if you have elevated, uh, the first things first, uh, you have to have central obesity. Plus two of triglyceride levels more than 1.7 millimole per liter or you can have HDL levels lesser than 1.03 millimoles per liter. That's the less than 1.29 in females. Okay, then you can have Finally, fasting um, I'll give you a small table. If you want to diagnose uh, diabetes, then the fasting glucose. Should be more than seven. Okay. Or Okay. What's impaired fasting glucose?
your fasting levels okay and what's impaired glucose tolerance so you will definitely encounter these values in your exam and uh, you might be very well tested on these two so just be aware of that so yes the answer was metabolic syndrome for the question and uh, try to go through this chart uh, before you get into your exams okay so that you are fresh with the values a uh, small thing uh, most of you have been asking me about some of the tips there are no tips per se that can be given to anybody who is appearing the exam in a week's time but there are certain things that you should remember okay first things first get your exams preparation like the physical preparation for the exam as in your location for the exam get it correctly where you have to appear for the exam you know reach the exam center if that's not your current town or place reach it one day at least one day in advance and know the place exactly where you have to go for the exam beforehand okay don't try to fish out the place in the morning okay third thing you have to be ready with your identification the photo identification thing whatever that is be it your passport or any other id card be sure you have all of these arranged the night before most importantly get a good night's sleep before the exam if you are panicking right before the exam that's not correct whatever you have prepared it's okay everything is fine and it's gonna be fine so you just have to get a good night's sleep because if you don't then whatever you have prepared in so many months and it's not just a preparation of one day okay part one exam will not test just your um, the previous one or two months that you have exerted but it will test your whole lateral thinking like i said before so don't worry you will do really well all of you are gonna perform amazingly i'm very sure about it because the way you are answering is fabulous okay just keep going keep your confidence high don't worry about anything and uh, yeah just reach the exam hall and that place down whatever it is uh, with good amount of time in hand most important next step is for the second paper before that uh, please make sure that you have food for you at least it is decided what you have to have because don't let yourself decide within that one hour time when you get before uh, the second paper right like the break in between one hour break that you get you should know exactly what you're going to eat and it should be a wholesome thing don't eat less don't eat more it should be fine if you eat less you go hypo right if you eat more you get sleepy so we don't want either of those two right so that's pretty much about it and uh, there are no negative markings so you have to attempt all of the questions there's one more thing uh, please make sure that you use the correct uh, circle for answering like you will have been given a 2B pencil in the exam and you have to make sure that you convert your answers into the answer paper like you have to circle the options A, B, C, D, E, whatever it is. Please don't keep it for the end. I have seen a lot of candidates losing out on a lot of marks when they have answered all the questions correctly but they did not have enough time at the end. Don't keep it till the end. Put a timer for yourself in your head, let's say 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes and can transfer all your answers to the answer sheet exactly at that point. So let's say when you finish 20 questions or 25 questions initially, just transfer all the answers and use that time as a break for your head. Okay, so enough of talking, uh, let's get back. Yeah, so here's your next question.
So Dr. MJ and Dr. Karthik are quick to say that and Dr. Elia Bharti as well. Uh, this is insulin abuse. Okay, the girl is probably taking the insulin that has been provided for her father, right? And she arrives in a very severe hypoglycemia. Okay, so all of you say B, let's get into it. It's very fairly simple. If you see the C peptide, if it's low and insulin levels is high, this is a clear cut case of insulin abuse. Okay. If your C peptide levels are high and insulin levels are high, then this will be a insulinoma. Okay. If none of this is high, if the patient presents to you with hypoglycemia, the same girl, suppose she presented to you with low C peptide and low insulin levels, then what will be your diagnosis? The same question, let's twist it a bit. Okay, so let's say the insulin levels were um, 6.2 or something. Okay, and the C peptide levels were the same. So what will be your diagnosis then, given everything else remains the same for this patient? In fact, insulin levels will be uh, a little on the higher end, let, let's say 7, and C-peptide will be um, around 0.4. Yes, exactly, Dr. Reji, you are right, and that is what I'm looking for. You should know what and how a sulfonylurea abuse patient presents. Yes, correct, absolutely correct. Yes, Dr. MJ, you're right as well. Okay, so remember this. Great, so all of you are absolutely well prepared. Let's try this one. Hmm. Dr. Karthik and Dr. MJ are really quick today, on fire it seems, <laughs> which is amazing. And Dr. Reji as well, Dr. Hashir, Dr. Pavan, uh, all of you are really answering like straight through it, which is great because that's how you have to answer in your exam. But the way you will rule out acromegaly over here is, uh, look at the blood pressure, okay? There's no increase in the blood pressure levels. And Dr. Shakun Shan also says D. Hi and welcome Shakun. So the answer over here will be metoclopramide. Bromocryptine uh, being a DOPA agonist. It's very simple, fairly simple. Uh, anterior pituitary. Secretes prolactin. Now, The ones that will decrease the production of prolactin are DOPA agonist, like bromocryptine. 
The ones that will increase the production are dopa antagonists. Dopamine. Okay. Dopamine. Right? So this will be uh, domperidone, metoclopramide. Uh, acromegaly and other haloperidol also and phenothiazines right so also remember please be sure to rule out pregnancy in any case of increase in prolactin if the prolactin levels are not really very high let's say in the range of uh, 3000 if it's less than that let's say in the range of 600 to 1200 something make sure you rule out pregnancy in the first instance okay always rule out pregnancy even if you are very sure as in in your clinical practice also uh, make sure to rule out pregnancy when you encounter high prolactin levels anywhere in the questions in the opd or anywhere okay all right i think this is enough for this question yep let's move on to the next one and we have discussed this question previously in some other chapter i guess topic Okay, so I agree with uh, Dr. MJ and Dr. Aisha right now. Uh, weight loss is the most appropriate initial treatment. Like I said, we have discussed it already, but I will discuss it again. It looks like we need to discuss PCOS a little bit again. You know the symptoms for PCOS, right? Uh, this is a question which will dev definitely come up in your exam. You cannot escape this question, okay? So the symptoms will be obesity, first one okay and uh, you will have oligomenorrhea uh, sometimes amenorrhea also but usually on oligomenorrhea then you will have hirsutism and the patient will have difficulty conceiving so subfertility yes dr Kartik, you're absolutely correct so that is what i will tell you right now um, there's an increase in LH FSH ratio. There's also an increase in the androgen levels, circulating androgen levels. As you can see, right? So, yeah. Now, what you have to do is the first and the most important thing to do. is weight loss it looks very simple but what weight loss actually does is it reduces the circulating insulin as well as androgen levels so that's how it uh, helps in the subfertility treatment okay uh, per se if you want to go for ovulation like per se drug for ovulation drug for inducing ovulation if it is asked very clearly that which of the following drug you will use for inducing ovulation It will be clomiphen citrate, clomiphen. Okay, and uh, metformin will not only help with insulin resistance. But it will also help with acanthosis nigricans.
okay uh, you also have OCP that is oral contraceptive pill use for regularizing the uh, menstrual cycle uh, okay i think that's enough please remember weight loss is the first one and the most important step in the case of pcos think pcos think weight loss okay next one okay so all of you have answered urinary catecholamines which is absolutely the correct answer yes dr aisha dr hasher dr reji dr kathik dr ilia bharti and dr mj all of you are absolutely right so we are talking about pheochromocytoma over here uh, you have a triad of headache palpitations I'm sweating if these three are present in your question or your patient think of pheochromocytoma it is almost 90 percent predictive but uh, you also have to see other things so that's why you do the urinary catecholamines means test the other tests uh, given are very fairly simple these two we have already discussed the short synactin ACTH test is for Addison's disease okay in Addison's you will have other things like um, BP will be low, the sodium values there will be hyponatremia. Okay, that will be there. There will be uh, there can be autonomic failure. There's orthostatic, and then uh, the BP is not able to be maintained, and other things, right? Like we discussed just. So just remember this, and uh, there's another somewhere where few chromocytoma will come up, but we'll get to that in some time. Yes, obviously hyperpigmentation because of the Okay, so all of you are very quick to answer again. 5-HIA, we are talking about carcinoid syndrome. Okay, and uh, once there are multiple stool samples that have been sent already. So when such a thing is given, then there is no role for further sampling. Okay. Platelet serotonin levels can be measured later on during the course of treatment. Yes, Dr. Pawan, you're right as well. Okay, so uh, what you need to remember about carcinoid syndrome. We have discussed this also somewhere else. I remember but that's okay. Um, these arise from the enterochromaffin cells of your intestine. They produce serotonin 
this is metabolized in your liver okay so the normal patient will not feel anything once there are metastasis to the liver then the serotonin gets converted into your like it gets circulated in your bloodstream and then you have all these uh, characteristic clinical features the most important one being facial flushing this is the q word for carcinoid syndrome remember that facial flushing with diarrhea and uh, bronchospasm maybe hypertension but yeah okay diagnosis will be urinary 5hia okay and uh, treatment you have to find out the tumor and resect it for control of other symptoms you can have somatostatin analogs such as octreotide okay all right uh, that's pretty much about it so let's get to the next one and i think i will we can have uh, mixed responses in this one also okay so lh is not given fsh values are given which are on the higher end so this higher fsh value is is suggestive of premature Yeah, I'm absolutely sorry for that typo over there. So if you want to revise your answers, you are welcome. Right? And the most important one over here is the pregnancy test is confirmed negative by urine test. Also remember that in some of the questions you will be given a choice of confirming the pregnancy test again. But the test kit, the urine test kit that you get uh, for confirming pregnancy it has a 95% sensitivity so don't waste your answer by confirming it again okay the home test kit that is available in the market has quite a high sensitivity level so don't worry about that so premature ovarian failure is the correct answer over here okay now we'll talk about the uh, yeah I was looking for this table so if you look at the secondary causes premature ovarian failure PCOS thyrotoxicosis uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, these are the causes for your secondary ovarian failure and primary you all know, okay. The negative pregnancy test in this question is very important and the elevated FSH levels is the one that is pointing you towards the secondary uh, cause that is premature ovarian failure, okay. 
fsh uh, greater than 20 in this case uh, in a woman less than 40 years of age is pretty much suggestive of ovarian failure okay so this is uh, obviously more than 20 if there was low fsh then there would be low estrogen levels and then prolactin levels should be ruled out to make sure that hyperprolactinemia is not there and hypothyroidism will lead to other one but hyperthyroidism mostly will lead to amenorrhea okay and hypo will lead usually to menorrhagia okay i think you all have answered already correctly there's not much to discuss in this one all right okay the one question that will definitely again sort of the similar question will definitely come up on your paper Anyone else wants to answer? Okay, so all of you say C, we go with C, M E N type 1. Okay, renal stone. In the right ureter, not the right corrected calcium ureter. Okay. And uh, primary hyperparathyroidism is present over here. But if you look at the history, Dr. Uh, Ilya Bharti, there is a previous transphenoidal surgery for a pituitary tumor. Now, when you add these two, that is a uh, parathyroid plus that is um, adenoma or anything like primary hyperparathyroidism with a pituitary adenoma, then it will be mentioned as MEN1 syndrome, right? Now, what you need to remember here is, let's talk about MEN2 first. The most striking feature will always be medullary thyroid cancer. Okay, you will always see this in a case of MEN2, whether it be A or B. All right. Now, the other two things will be parathyroid adenoma or like hyperparathyroidism, but pheochromocytoma is also unique. Okay, so you have to remember that pheochromocytoma and medullary thyroid cancer are only seen in two. Now, the thing only seen in 2B is marfanoid habitus. And uh, you also have mucosal neuromas of your uh, mouth, oral mucus, uh, and eyes, and all of those places. Okay. Now, marfanoid habitus is what separates 2B from 2A. Okay, so these two are clear. Coming back to MEN1, you have three uh, types of neoplasm, parathyroid and pituitary, mostly it will be an adenoma. And you will also have pancreas, whether it can be an uh, islet cell tumor, but this is not usually mentioned in the question because it is not usually seen in the patients. It appears quite later in the patients. That's why you will not find much mentioning about the pancreatic tumors, but definitely pituitary adenoma, and parathyroid uh, primary hyperparathyroidism uh, features will be there like like we just saw like renal stones uh, hyper uh, the corrected calcium levels will be higher uh, confusion myopathy stiff joints and all those features will be there make sure that if when you see high calcium levels high calcium levels along with pituitary features go ahead with men1 
okay i hope there's no confusion now men2 please remember there are two things which will definitely be mentioned pheochromocytoma and medullary thyroid cancer in 2b you will definitely have a marfanoid habitus and in 2a you have three pancreas pituitary and parathyroid all right i think that's more than enough for this one let's go ahead Okay. okay so let's go through the question stem here because we have a difference of opinions um, the fasting blood glucose levels are really high over here now the father suffered a mi at the age of 74 so we do have a cardiovascular history in the family and the patient okay so the right answer to this one will be ability to achieve and maintain glycemic control okay now you cannot just uh, renal function is absolutely right i'm not saying that this is not the right answer per se but you have to select one answer which will encompass all of this okay now when you control the like you tightly control the glycemic levels you basically prevent the cardiovascular and the renal complications that are going to happen okay patient weight is also important and fasting glucose di at diagnosis is okay but this is not so relevant over here okay but this statement over here will encompass this one this one and this one okay that is why you should choose a broader statement always yeah lifestyle modification will also be a factor and so Tight glycemic control is what will actually help this patient. Creatinines are, this level is really high for a BMI level, which is more than 30. So you have to maintain this because you have to prevent both microvascular as well as macrovascular levels. Okay. And uh, HbA1c, like you know, uh, every drop in the HbA1c levels, one drop uh, will, you know, help with the developing complications like will help retard the development of complications and uh, since retinopathy neuropathy and uh, nephropathy these are three things that will happen so you have to encompass all of this and that is why maintaining a tight glycemic control will help you always try to choose a broader answer in such a uh, way question this is sort of a way question not a very uh, cut to cut question so you have to see that and you are right in saying renal function but you also then have to consider that there's a family history of cardiovascular disease in the family right so considering all of that tight glycemic control is the way to go okay i hope i'm clear okay this is straightforward question Dr. MJ is really quick to answer that one. Dr. Ilya Bharti says E. Dr. Kartik, okay, E. So papillary carcinoma is the most common type of thyroid cancer. Uh, just remember this that you have five types of thyroid cancers 
out of which papillary carcinoma is the most common one almost 70 percent of the carcinomas will be that the next one is follicular with 20 percent incidence okay and then you have medullary cancer like how we discussed in men2 right so both in 2a and 2b you will have medullary carcinoma this happens from the occurs from the c cells of the thyroid secretes calcitonin there's an anaplastic uh, type also and uh, you have lymphomas also but the anaplastic cancer is uh, highly malignant obviously and uh, anaplastic means there's severe anaplasia going on so it's highly malignant and they are equally rare and thank god for that so yeah this is the one but remember papillary carcinoma is the most common thyroid cancer okay moving on to the next one Okay, so C is the correct answer. Pseudo hypoparathyroidism and uh, why so? We will know because in hypoparathyroidism you have a reduced secretion of PTH. Just write it down quickly for you. Okay, and in pseudo hypoparathyroidism. The target cells uh, are insensitive to parathyroid hormone. Okay. So you have an elevated PTH with reduced calcium levels. Okay. So this is basically the difference. You also have other clinical features associated with it, like uh, short. Fourth and fifth intercarpals. A low IQ. Short stature. Okay. In pseudo pseudo hyper hypoparathyroidism. You will have the same clinical features, but the biochemistry levels will be normal. That is, PTH and calcium levels will be normal. Okay. But you will only have the clinical features. That is pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Okay. So I hope that is not confusing to any of you. Thank you. I'll just add to complete the whole picture. Okay. All right. So that is about hypoparathyroidism. Let's
Yes, Dr. MJ, I was expecting you to correct it to C. Uh, you can have typos, it's okay. Don't have to say sorry, we are all learning over here. So most of you say C, which is correct. We are looking for a higher aldosterone levels that is driving out the potassium from the body and creating an alkalotic picture. It's quite an alkalosis over here. You can see uh, this is an alkalosis picture. Okay, and uh, you also have a hypertensive picture over here. So this is primary hyperaldosteronism. Now you can have Kohn's disease as the diagnosis over here later on when you find out uh, what is the cause. But for initial diagnostic evaluation, uh, you have to understand that first you have to find an elevated aldosterone levels upon reduced renin levels. Okay, that will help you identify the uh, first things like getting a diagnosis first, and then you can go ahead with CT abdomen. This will be the next investigation. Okay, so this is your next investigation CT abdomen to find out where is uh, the tumor. It could be your um, adrenal hypoplasia or uh, primary hyperaldosteronism, whatever. Okay. So I think uh, also CT will help you identify whether the tumor is resectable or not on the adrenals. Okay. All right. So we are almost approaching the end of the session. I can see that you guys are keeping the energy going, which is great. I also want the diagnosis uh, in this question. Yes, you are right, uh, Dr. Reji and Dr. Pavan. There is no treatment required, but uh, what will you do is the what the question is asking. Uh, the question is asking what is the most appropriate next step. So even if okay, so nobody wants to change anything. Yes, you are absolutely right. This is poor compliance for the patient. The patient is a known case of hypothyroidism. Okay. And the TSH values are going really high and the T4 levels are normal. So a normal T4 levels on the day of examination reveals that the patient has taken the dose correctly on this day. But this level over here reveals that the patient is not compliant with the therapy. So when the patient is not compliant with the therapy, absolutely correct. I want you to educate the patient regarding the diagnosis and treatment. You should have a discussion, uh, proper consultation with the patient and try to find out what are the issues with her compliance because taking a medication daily is not an easy task. So a not an easy task for us also to convince them to take it daily, but then you have to educate the patient. Okay. All right. So look out for yes. Yes, Dr. MJ. Dr. Kathik, Dr. Reji and Pawan, you are absolutely right. So don't forget to discuss with the patient. Okay, patient education is very important, right? So all of you are very clear with thyroid diseases now. I'm happy to see that. Be on the lookout for subclinical thyroiditis, okay? And uh, Addisonian crisis also. Uh, these two questions, they come up very frequently. And Addisonian crisis will look very simple to you, but... Uh, it's actually a serious 
issue. So Okay. Dr. Pawan, do you want to give an answer? And Dr. Hashir also? Dr. Aisha also says A. Okay. So I think most of you have answered already. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the correct answer for this one. Now, what you need to remember in congenital adrenal hyperplasia is uh, there's increased production of the intermediate hormones. So decreased production of uh, steroids that is uh, aldosterone and cortisol, but increased production of uh... Okay uh, Dr. Reggie, I think you got a typo over there. That's okay. These are basically intermediates. Increased production of cortisol. What is the deficiency? The deficiency is 21. Hydroxylase. deficiency okay right so this is the most important deficiency 90% of the cases you can also have 5% of the cases they have 11 hydroxylase deficiency but if your question has both of them please go ahead with 21 hydroxylase deficiency this is the most important point okay so this excess production of estrogen and testosterone will cause the virilization in our patient over here right and uh, that's about it the last question over here so this is also something that you will encounter in your questions but it's very uh, easy to miss out on this one that's why i put this question because it looks something very similar to other things like other diseases Okay, you also have to see the investigations. Okay, we have a difference of opinion and Dr. Karthik says E now, that's okay. All of you have been already fabulous, so don't worry. Yes, thyroid storm is the correct answer and the most common cause for thyroid storm is 
non compliance with the medications okay so if we talk about thyroid storm over here you will have fever tachycardia confusion most importantly you will have hypertension now if there were the question stem mentioned hypotensive episode we could think about sepsis and other things okay but hypertension usually points towards uh, thyroid storm you can also have abnormal liver function test also uh, ruling out paracetamol levels over here pcm levels are less than 10 so definitely this is not a pcm poisoning uh, one more thing is let's just go through it quickly the white cell count is fairly okay all right so this is not depressed if it was a side effect of carbamazole uh, long term side effect you can expect the wbc counts to go low okay so that's how it is going to show up most common cause will always be non compliance with anti thyroid drugs okay and uh, other side effects are okay so i hope this is all clear to you now i want to this is yeah so So what is this guys please tell me quickly i'll not waste much of your time if you can make out by my not so artistic diagram but i hope my i make my point clear today so what do you see guys please tell me what do you see elephant yes this is an elephant right and uh, if i draw a man over here this man will be almost 1 by third or 1/4 of the height and the size of an elephant right but if you okay i just erased the head of the man so it's a headless man right now right okay looks like an african elephant to me right so this man over here the master of the elephant has a stick in his hand right usually they have a stick the stick is not even 1 by 100 size of the elephant right so but this man is able to control this elephant using this stick which is 1 by 100th of the size and uh, or maybe one by thousand of the size and it doesn't even have 1% of the net strength of an elephant so how is it able to control this elephant this is called conditioning right when the elephant is a small cute little elephant this man uses the same stick to control it and the elephant gets controlled okay so the whole idea is that in our lives we all have such form of conditioning going on okay we have our shackles in our head we have our limitations we have our constraints we have our problems which constrain us because we are conditioned to believe that we cannot break through them just like the elephant believes that he cannot fight the master because when it was a small baby elephant it used to get hit by that stick and it used to feel very bad about it so stop all such conditioning think free you are all absolutely fabulous you all have prepared really well just go ahead in the exams give your best shot 
and don't worry about the results whatsoever it may be it will always be in your favor okay if it's positive or negative the results will always be in your favor don't worry about it just break through your shackles and forget about all the conditioning okay you all can do it you are absolutely fabulous people you all have prepared really well i don't want to name all of you one by one but all of you have been really 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 amazing all this time i hope all of you get amazing results and you all get back to me with amazing results okay thank you so much for your precious time i hope all of you liked our classes so leave some comments nice comments in the box and let us know how else we can help you all right all the best for your exams thank you